Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everybody. My Heart Leaps Up is perhaps William Wordsworth's shortest great poem. In just a few lines, he expresses beautifully the innocence of children and the important role that childhood plays in the making of an adult. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. The title of my talk today is Unashamed of Innocence. Now, a dictionary definition of innocence reads this. It reads, purity, lack of corruption. Today, my focus will be on the importance of our children's innocence and why I believe there is an urgency for us to be unashamed in our efforts to protect this precious birthright. Jesus said, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. This is a really serious warning, isn't it, to anyone who would corrupt a child or expose them to concepts that violate their innocence and deprive them of their childlikeness. Because every child is born with an innocence that deserves protection. At the same time, we know that within every child there is an inclination to sin. And that is precisely why it is so terrible to lead a child into wrong rather than leading them in ways that are for their good and for, not for their harm. Paths of truth and purity. In Romans, Paul speaks of the importance of being wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. But our prideful, postmodern and post-Christian society condones, it promotes and it even celebrates our children's lack of innocence. It applauds. Good is called evil and evil is called good. Consider our society's obsession with gender fluid ideology. It is not an exaggeration to say that the promotion of this theory in our universities, our schools, and even our kindergartens is actually changing the face of a generation. Senator Louise Pratt is the chair of the Federal Senate Standing Committee that oversees education in our nation. In November last year, she said, Drag Queen Storytime is a wonderful idea that celebrates diversity, and I know that children and families will really enjoy this family-friendly celebration of LGBTI culture. So wrong. Drag Queen's reading to children in libraries are actually promoting a dangerous ideology to small children, including the introduction of sexual concepts. The practice reminds me of a show that I saw as a child watching on my grandmother's black and white TV. It featured a group of white-skinned people who painted their faces black with exaggerated features and they sang and danced. Can you imagine that today? And yet Senator Pratt promotes the practice of men dressing up as women with exaggerated features and makeup in an offensive stereotypical manner as a wonderful form of entertainment for our children. And if we don't like it, we're actually labeled transphobic. At the core of gender fluid ideology is the claim that feelings determine reality. Trans activism has whitewashed the scientific fact that human beings are male and female. There are two sexes, XX and XY. Anything outside of that is a genetic abnormality that can still be classified as male or female based on the presence or absence of the Y chromosome. There is no Z and there is no W. And to assert anything else is actually a cruel lie that will never provide the long-term wholeness and happiness that people are seeking. <laughs> Cosmetic surgery and cross-sex hormones can change appearances and they can stunt growth, but they cannot turn someone from one sex into the other. It's a biological impossibility. 
And if you ignore the truth of this, all you actually have left are weird stereotypes. But this ideology is being taught in our schools as fact. From kindergarten through to university, children are being forced to unlearn the difference between boys and girls. In 2010, the Safe Schools Program promoted gender fluidity, fluidity to children under the camouflage of anti-bullying. In 2015, four-year-olds were read The Gender Fairy, and its mantra read this, it said, only you know if you are a boy or a girl. In 2018, the Genderbred Person Program was rolled out as a model for understanding sexuality. Now, in this program, a sexual health doctor in taxpayer-funded lectures tells students that their gender is not tied to biological sex. But the material also suggests that boys who identify as male are privileged, saying this, if, and I'm quoting, if someone is born with male reproductive organs and genitalia, he is very likely to be raised as a boy, identify as a man, and express himself masculinely. We call this cisgender, and it grants a lot of privilege. Evidence that our children are being confused by early and constant exposure to transgenderism is not hard to find. Psychologists are actually speaking out more and more against the practice of giving puberty blockers to children and the amputation of healthy body parts, but referrals of children to gender clinics continue to skyrocket. Children too young to even know what a puberty blocker is are being encouraged to question their identity and they're being directed by adults into renouncing their natal sex. Educators are normalising the use of hormonal treatments to solve complex issues that are related to mental health and identity. Puberty is not a disease, and yet our doctors are giving medications to actually make it stop. Side effects from these drugs include abnormal bone and brain development, along with sex organ stunting, dysfunction and potential sterility. And what makes this even more diabolical is that without medical intervention, over 90% of all children who are confused about their gender will embrace their natal sex through puberty. Obviously though, puberty is the very process that is prevented by puberty blockers. Despite this, guidelines promoted by our nation's largest gender clinic at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital warn against withholding treatment to transition. We're told that in 2006, this gender clinic had one child client. In 2012, there were 18. In 2016, there were 250 children, and some of them were as young as three. In 2018, this clinic's caseload of young patients increased by 41% last year. Clinic director Michelle Telford recently told an Australian medical journal, we have two or three year olds who verbalise very clearly how they feel about their gender and we listen. Two and three year olds. Dr Telford told ABC News that the Royal Children's Hospital should consider performing double mastectomies for girls who want to feel more like a boy. Now, ACL are not alone in speaking out against this. There is growing international concern that troubled, confused teenage girls are being primed to come out as trans boys, seeking irreversible testosterone treatment and sometimes mastectomies. And obviously, these come with the risk of serious complications. Children who are confused about their gender need our love. They need our respect. They need our understanding, but above all, they need the truth. But gender fluid propaganda machine is actually based on lies. So now we hear that pregnant women are no longer identified as female, but rather people with uteruses. <laughs> Men are now included in Australian legislation as being able to have an abortion. Facial feminisation with a price tag of up to $70,000 has now been recommended for Medicare subsidy in our public hospitals. A recent report cited the rapid increase of patient demand in gender clinics, but instead of this actually sounding alarm bells, the report urged more surgical training and Medicare subsidies for gender-affirming surgery for trans persons. The world's gone mad and perhaps not as clearly as we see it in women's sport. Women's sport is changing radically because of men identifying as women. 
Under the banner of anti-discrimination, new doctrines are being imposed by legal force on mums and dads and their children, as well as the teachers, officials, volunteers and workers responsible for the running of sporting competitions across our nation, which actually affects close to a third of the Australian population. The 2019 Guidelines for the Inclusion of Transgender and Gender Diverse People in Sport, developed by the Australian Human Rights Commission, made it clear that any individual organisation found to discriminate can be held liable. So men identifying as women are to be allowed to compete in women's competitions and to deny them this is discriminatory. To make things even more intimidating, the burden of proof has actually been reversed, effectively rendering the accused guilty until proven innocent. So try and grasp this. In 2013, the Diagnostic and Scientific Manual of Mental Health reported that the prevalence of gender dysphoria in adults ranged from 0.005% to 0.04% in males, and from 0.002% to 0.003% in females. But our Australian sport guidelines now suggest transgender numbers have increased to the point of filling an allocation of 20% in our sporting teams across the nation. Sporting bodies, including the International Olympic Committee, seem to be proactively courting the destruction of women's sport. At the Pacific Games in Samoa this year, the winner of the women's 87 kilogram division in weightlifting was a man identifying as a woman. This man received the gold medal, and the woman who received the silver medal, who deserved the gold medal, actually lifted seven kilo less than the guy who got gold. She wasn't even in with a chance. It makes me wonder, if men can compete against women in sport from the Olympics down, why can't able-bodied athletes compete in the Paralympics? <laughs> Across the globe, we are seeing the removal of safe spaces that pr provided protection for women and girls. And we should never negate the, the true experience of male victims of violence. They are there and we should never negate that. But there are historic gendered patterns in the perpetration and impact of violence. In Australia, most victims of violence, male and female, report a male perpetrator. And the overwhelming majority of domestic violence and sexual assault is committed by men against women. But under our government's draft religious freedom laws, a Christian rehab centre for women would not be shielded from discrimination claim for turning away a biological male who identified as female. And in a recent case, a male identifying as a female applied for admission to a Christian women's re residential rehab program. And he was asked to come back, he, she was asked to come back for a second interview and he threatened discrimination action. But the hesitation shown by the program, according to the, um, the program director, was not only about the, it being a Christian facility, but also in consideration of those already in the facility. Because women are there, they are seeking a safe place. And the last thing they need to do is to share bedrooms and bathrooms with a biological man. Can you imagine any woman or girl walking into a female bathroom and being confronted by a six foot plus male stranger and their first response not being fear. In schools that have introduced unisex toilets, schoolgirls are putting their health at risk by not drinking so they don't have to use the toilet. Girls are taking days off when they have their period rather than share a bathroom with boys. Schools have become less safe for children who are told not to object when their instincts tell them something is wrong about having a boy or a man in the girls' bathroom. But with this marginal theory being written to Australian law, the implications actually affect us all, not just women who are needing a shelter, not just women in sport, and not just our children at school. And the least of our worries is actually being branded transphobic. Parents are fearing losing their children Damien Riggs is a gender academic at Flinders University and he suggests that hospitals, hospitals may have to take court action to authorise treatment of trans-identifying children with puberty blocker drugs so as to sidestep sceptical parents. In a recent issue of the Australian Psychological Society magazine, Insight, 
Dr Riggs advised this. He advised clinicians to consider alerting authorities to child neglect if other clinicians or family members take a less than affirming approach to a young person identifying as transgender. The so-called so safe schools also agree that a child can be assisted to transition without parental consent. And so I would say to you that increasingly our schools are becoming dangerous places for our children. This past week, two separate mothers contacted me and they were concerned about graphic sexual content being shown in schools without their knowledge. 13-year-olds shown sexually explicit videos. 16-year-olds shown a video in class which included full frontal nudity and the act of sex. A TV series proposed for a year 12 class with scenes which I can only describe as pornography and I would not even tell you what I saw. And this is diabolical. And such a contrast to what we read in Philippians 4.8, isn't it, where it says, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Which actually brings me to the second issue that I'll briefly address. And sadly today, pornography is almost impossible to avoid for our children. The average age of first exposure is now 11. A 2018 study by New Zealand's Office of Film and Literature Classification found that 37% of young children are confronted by pornography by accident and a further 34% because someone showed them. Our kids are marinating in a pornified culture and they are being targeted aggressively online, even in children's games via pop-ups. And this is by an evil, multi-billion dollar pornography industry. And these attacks do not leave our children unscarred. Recent Australian statistics show that one in four young people, these are Australian young people, are at risk of serious mental illness. 30% of children and adolescents have had two or more mental disorders in the past 12 months. One in three young Australians have been reported to experience moderate to high levels of psychological distress. 41,000 of our young people aged between 12 and 17 have attempted suicide. Child-on-child -child assault is occurring at rates never seen before, and this has been attributed by many academics as kids acting out what they have seen in pornography. So what do we do? How do we push back? Well, firstly, I would say to you that we have to examine ourselves. We are called to be holy. We are called to be set apart for God. We're called to be different from the world. And this must show in our behaviour, both seen and unseen. We should live differently in a way that resembles Christ rather than our culture. And today, if there are impure ways or thoughts or ungodly confusion that you need to repent of, or that I need to repent of, that is where we have to start, to get right with God. And then as we align ourselves to God's plan for our life, we are called to be salt and light for others. Purity, just like impurity, is taught by example. Children should witness the sort of love between their parents that is described in Corinthians as never failing, as self-giving. They need to see the fulfilment that comes when physical intimacy belongs to marriage alone, one man, one woman. And that's why it's so important that the church has a central place in family life because children thrive when they see living examples of purity not only in their parents but in those around them, whether married or single. God's people are called to be stars in the universe, holding out the word of life. And ACL is committed to this and we want to help others, we want to help you and all of our 170,000 followers to do the same. One effective way of speaking truth is by responding to government inquiries. And there is a current federal inquiry that I really want to encourage you to participate in. And the inquiry is looking at ways to protect Australian children online. The particular focus of this inquiry is on age verification solutions for gambling and pornography sites. 
So this is great news and a key issue for ACL. I've been with ACL almost nine years now and this, this um, issue predates me. Lyle Shelton has been onto this issue before I came but it's something that's very, very dear to my heart. But every Australian, not just the Australian Christian Lobby, but every Australian is invited to have their say. The closing date for submissions is next Friday. Now we're setting up a web page, it should be ready this weekend um, to help guide you through the submission process. You'll get an email on Monday that will actually take you straight to that web page to help you go through the submission process because what we want is we want Australia to be the act actually the safest place in the world for children to go online. Wouldn't that be great if Australia could take that tag? <laughs> Just imagine that. Australia being known as the safest place in the world for children to go online. Now age verification is only just a really small solution but it is a start, it's a small part of the solution but do please make a submission because we want to encourage the government in these submissions, we want to encourage them for looking at this because by having this inquiry it's an admission, an acknowledgement that we have a problem that they've gone to an inquiry, so that's great, because we want to show them that our children's safety and, and our, their innocence online is something that we care deeply about. In Ezekiel, God said he looked for somebody who would build up the wall and stand before him in the gap on behalf of the land. And our children's innocence is under attack. And they need us to step into the gap and rebuild, rebuild the wall of righteousness. This requires us to speak truth in the public square. The truth that we are created male and female, created by God in the image of God, male and female. It's the truth about the destructive impact of pornography. But I just want to say in closing, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for staying with us as we press on for the sake of our children. And we do this for the sake of our children, but we do it above all for the glory of God. Thank you so much.